Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Welcome to the Avexia webinar series. Our topic for tonight is food sensitivity testing, demystifying IgG. My name is Joanne Iverson. I'm the Director of Client Relations for Avexia Diagnostics and will be your host for this evening. Today, I have the distinct pleasure of being joined by our guest, Dr. Jill Hart, who will be our presenter for this webinar. Dr. Hart is an expert biochemist with over 30 years of experience in the development and validation of hospital standard diagnostic tests and testing services. Dr. Hart completed her PhD in pituitary function in 1987 and started her career as senior biochemist at the Hammersmith Hospital. Dr. Hart, Dr. Hart worked for a number of R&D companies, being responsible for the development and validation of unique diagnostic tests and testing services for hospital, practitioner, and consumer use. Dr. Hart joined the food intolerance company York Test in 2005 and has been instrumental in building this food intolerance, allergy, and health testing company into the market leader it is today. As York Test's scientific director, Dr. Hart has applied her scientific and regulatory knowledge to all York Test services. Joining Dr. Hart tonight will be Dr. Wayne Sedano, our Director of Clinical Support and Education here at Avexia Diagnostics. Additionally, Dr. Sedano is the Director of Integrative Medicine Education for the College of Integrative Medicine and lectures and teaches internationally. Without further delay, I will now turn the webinar over to Dr. Hart. Thank you. Thank you, Avexia, for inviting me today to talk about something, a subject that I'm really, really passionate about, and that's food sensitivity testing. And we're going to try and uh, demystify some of the, the background to IgG testing today with a with a extensive um, research uh, review and also extensive knowledge from the York test base. And we'll start with a little disclaimer. The following information has not necessarily been evaluated by the FDA and does not replace the advice of a licensed medical professional. And this information is not intended to treat, cure, or diagnose any particular health condition. As you can see in the introduction, my name is Dr. Jill Hart. I'm a, bi a biochemist, PhD biochemist, and scientific director at York Test Laboratories. Uh, where I've worked for 18 years. <clears throat> a little bit to start with about York Test Heritage. We were uh, started as a company in, in 1982, so we have actually 41 years of experience now. We are the UK's leading food sensitivity, allergy and health test provider. We're also a leading food sensitivity test provider in the US helping practitioners to support their clients' health, nutrition, and well-being. We have our own accredited laboratory offering high-quality testing and accurate results. And this is absolutely fundamental to what we do at York Test. The agenda today is to talk a little bit about food-specific IgG antibodies, to talk about our York Test food-specific IgG testing process, provide some York test evidence, and we've got a lot of that, uh, thankfully, and uh, to talk about some independent clinical studies. And then at the end, uh, Vexia will help us talk about how we can work together. A little bit of background to start with. Um, I know many of you will know this already, but I always think it's important to have a little, uh, you know, a, a background and uh, to look at the basics first. The differences between food sensitivity and food allergy. Food allergy is um, that immediate reaction you get to foods, um, often uh, foods like cow's milk, eggs, shellfish, peanuts, tree nuts. Even the smallest amount can provoke an allergic and potentially life-threatening uh, response. The, the antibody involved is the IgE antibody and um, you know as I've said, this is potentially life-threatening and very different to what we're going to talk about with food sensitivities. Food sensitivity is a broad term. It covers a very wide scope. Food sensitivities are much more common. They're harder to identify. 
at York Test, when people come to us, um, if they have positive reactions to foods on our IgG test, they often have five or six different reactions on average, which means that this is quite hard to identify if you were to do an elimination diet without that information. Reactions are inflammatory and can take up to 72 hours to manifest themselves. Again, that makes it really difficult to work out what's going on. And multiple food and drink ingredients can be involved, as I've said. If we look at the prevalence of food sensitivity, I'm still really trying to find a, a good statistic for this. But overall, food sensitivities and intolerances and related diseases are estimated to affect at least 100 million people worldwide. The prevalence of food sensitivity is believed to be as high as 45% of the population. Many would actually say more than that, and we all come across people that we know that remove foods from the diet that disagree with them, that not for reasons that, you know, like allergy. As I've said, the, the true prevalence of food sensitivity is, is really unknown. And I think it's also important to consider what is meant by a food sensitivity and intolerance. So let's look at the different types of food sensitivity. We can divide up food sensitivities into non-immune mediated. These involve things like um, enzyme deficiencies, such as a deficiency in the enzyme lactose for those with lactose intolerance or histamine intolerance uh, with, a, with a deficiency in diamine oxidase. It could be due to FODMAP foods, those fermentable oligo dye and monosaccharides and polyols, those small chain carbohydrates that can um, uh, gather in, in the gut and actually ferment in the gut, causing problems. This is a non-immune mediated response. And also chemical sensitivities. It's really important to remember that you can't have an immune reaction to a tiny molecule. And tiny molecules such as caffeine, sulfites, benzoate, MSG, ascorbic acid, etc., and even things like sugar and alcohol, you know when you've had them. You ingest them and they go straight through into the uh, bloodstream, through to the blood-brain barrier, and you know when you've had these. And then there is the bracket of immune system involvement. We've got to talk a little bit about some autoimmune disorders today, but celiac disease is an autoimmune disorder, obviously reactions to glut gluten, um, and responses to mainly your food proteins. You need larger molecules here. You've got your IgE allergy, which we've talked about. That's your allergic, classical allergic reaction. Or you have your IgG reaction, which is what we're talking about today, uh, which is often called delayed allergy. Not so much nowadays, but it used to be often called delayed allergy, the IgG reaction. The food sensitivity testing market um, you know, consists really of tests that are used to help towards the diagnosis of known disorders things like celiac disease, lactose intolerance, and your allergies. Also tests that provide information to help prioritise which foods to avoid and which are suitable to eat. And that's where the food-specific IgG testing comes in. It's not diagnosis, diagnostic of any condition. It's not a health assessment. It is actually providing a nutritional therapist with a guideline, a guideline which they can choose to take on board and help people prioritise which foods to avoid and which are suitable to eat. Sadly, the food sensitivity testing market also includes tests which have no basis in science at all. And we're seeing more and more of these hair tests that claim that energy levels and energy waves can be produced by hair that can tell us about food sensitivity. There is no basis in science for these. They should not be allowed to be on the market. Equally, um, IgG tests for chemical sensitivity tests, that's uh, companies that claim they can actually detect um, IgG to very tiny molecules. Um, again, these have no basis in science. So what options do people have for those who suspect they might react to foods and wish to identify them? A lot of people do nothing. Actually, a lot of people live with their symptoms thinking it's normal for them. They may live with uh, you know, low energy, low mood, digestive problems, and just think it's to do with their lifestyle, their busy lives, which to some extent it might be. But a lot of people don't realise they can actually be helped by changing their diet and, and removing IgG-positive foods. 
they can guess what to remove without any evidence. A lot of people have fads of being gluten free, particularly at the moment. Um, you know, let's remove gluten and let's see what happens. Not everybody needs to do that. Um, an elimination diet and challenge process, which is our standard elimination diet and challenge process that we all know. But to do that without any evidence is really difficult. And so what we provide with the food specific ITG is a guideline, a shortcut fast track to uh, provide information before you start an elimination diet process. We've talked about demystifying IgG and I want to talk a little bit about the IgG antibodies themselves. Because people talk about IgG as if it's something really simple and it really isn't. IgG makes up actually 10 to 20 percent of all blood plasma protein. That's an awful lot of IgG. Clearly these aren't all IgGs to foods. There'll be IgGs to things like bacteria um, and other things that we're, we're bombarding our body with. But uh, nevertheless, it's an important antibody. There are four subtypes of IgG. IgG1 is the most prevalent, 60%. IgG4, which is less involved in food sensitivity reactions, is uh, only down at 4%. So we at York just know, and we, um, we've developed our test back in 1998, we know, knew that we needed to test for all four subtypes um, of IgG in order to capture all the different types of reactions. IgG is long acting. This is really good for us, actually, because uh, we transport our samples across the world, have a global reach. Um, and you can see that IgG 1, 2 and 4 have a 21 day half life. So that means they, they're long acting in the blood. Um, IgG3 is between 7 and 21 days, but if you think about IgE, which is your allergy antibody, that's when you've got a 12 to 48 hour window um, and a half-life. And that means that it's going to come up in the, in the blood and come down re really quickly, which is what you see with a traditional allergic reaction. Because of this, our, our um, IgG that we collect um, is really stable. We have 30 day stability at room temperature and we've done uh, transport studies as well with our unique York test blood collection one, which I'm going to show you in a moment. I'd encourage you to look at this, uh, this um, particular review article by Fiderson um, from back in 2014. It really demonstrates the complexity of the four different subtypes of IgG and what's involved. Not something for me to go into today. That shoot would really require a, an expert immunologist to do that. But I think it's really important just to, to summarize that we are talking about something that's not just one thing. We're talking about very complex IgG uh, reactions here. And there are inflammatory and uh, pro-inflammatory parts of IgG, particularly IgG 1 to 3. And there are IgGs that are more involved in tolerance, which is more like the IgG 4. The IgG profile of a given individual is determined by the inherited genetics and can potentially influence the clinical manifestations of the immune response, which ultimately differs between individuals and populations. So again, there is a lot more complexity added uh, because of that as well. So we can see that IgG antibodies are pro-inflammatory, mainly IgG 1 and 3. They can involve complement activation and immune complexes, again, one to three. They inv involve FC gamma receptor act actions, activating and inhibiting IgG one to four. They offer protection. And sometimes when we talk about tolerance, uh, we can talk about the IgG four because there's an element of tolerance there. But that's not about food intolerance or food sensitivity. There's an interplay with the T cell response and the role for the T helper cells, T regulatory cells and cytokines. And the role in autoimmune diseases, we'll be going to talk about that in a bit later on. Um, and it's a core component IgG of the intestinal inflammatory response. And that's why it's so important to measure. I was drawn to a, um, a recent publication, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. Um, where a study that compared um, an IgG guided elimination diet to um, a, a low FODMAP diet versus a traditional nutrition advice. And this is a, a really um, 
really great study, which as I said, I'll go into details later, but what really struck me was this, this uh, comment as part of the conclusions. Since the discovery of the T helper 17 lineage, IgG must be looked at from a totally different point of view than before. IgG is not only the immunoglobulin that protects us against foreign infectious agents, but is now also recognized as a mediator of inflammation and is responsible for autoimmune diseases. And the balance of T helper and T regulatory cells is largely responsible for the pro inflammatory conditions in our body. Um, so I, I, you know, I think that you know we, we need to remember this when we're talking about IgG. Alterations of the microbiome and leaky gut induce the activation of T helper 17 mediated immune responses and the production of pro inflammatory IgG antibodies against food and other potential harmful antigens present in the gut. Uh, I think that's a, a really great um, article, which I will reference later on for you to uh, further read if you like. And there we go, there's part of the reference there. Um, and we'll talk about the FODMAP versus IgG later on. I was also really drawn recently to this, um, this publication last September, um, looking at associations between food-specific IgG antibodies and intestinal permeability markers. We're all very interested in watching the slow um, evolvement of knowledge around zomulin and occludin. Um, but I think, you know, I think we're seeing now that food IgG is associated and can be associated with intestinal permeability markers and should be considered when in assessing intestinal permeability. Intestinal permeability comes hand, you know, hand in hand with, uh, with food IgG because the more permeability you have, the more likelihood of bringing in larger molecules um, and more likelihood of actually seeing some of those uh, and causing an immune reaction. But you don't know which food you're reacting to unless you do a test. You can see that in the next schematic here. When you've got um, you know, large food particles, number one here with large food particles coming into, into the gut. Um, if you've got a, a leaky gut or more permeable gut, number two, your gut membrane tends to be more permeable, allowing more uh, large molecules into uh, the bloodstream. And uh, you know, 70 percent of your immune systems in your gut. Um, and you're then going to see that, you know, occasionally those immune reactions occur. I always think about um, the IgG antibody as being like a claw. Any antibody is like a claw. It needs something large to latch onto. And you can see here the sch schematic too, the normal tight junctions of a normal gut versus the inflammation and abnormal immune reactions of a leaky gut as well. A whole separate topic for another day, um, but uh, a really interesting one at that. So 70% of your immune system is, is in your gut. Your immune gut immune system has the challenge of responding to pathogens while remaining relatively unresponsive to food antigens and all that the gut microflora are producing. Tolerance is not the normal state, or sorry, is the normal state. And it's not the case that high levels of IgG antibodies are formed to all foods that are consumed regularly. So, you know, it, it's, it's, intolerance is normal. Not the case that high levels of IgG antibodies are formed to all foods that are consumed regularly. Um, otherwise, we would be seeing far more than the four to six foods on average in positive reactions. Increased gut permeability to large molecules has a role in exacerbating inappropriate immune responses. And IgG is one small piece in a very large immune system jigsaw and is a long acting marker of inflammation, which you know, we're going to see more evidence about IgG testing later on, but it's just borne out, underpinned by the immunology. Really interested, actually, we're talking about subtypes. Um, really interested to see this article back in 2017, which actually links the different subtypes to different autoimmune conditions. Now, these aren't necessarily, obviously, food IgG, but they are IgG in general, and it just goes to show the pro-inflammatory way that IgG is working. You can see IgG 1, 2, 3 and 4 involved in things like hypothyroidism, irritable bowel, rheumatoid arthritis, pancreatitis, celiac disease, etc. And you can see how important they are in that autoimmune response. 
She's really mindful of this actually when looking at the actions of IgG antibodies and the autoimmune link. Things like Sjogren syndrome, um, things like um, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and also inflammatory bowel disease, which we're going to talk about later on with references later on. I think the article by Cook um, shows, you know, IgG levels of specific antibodies are significantly higher in the autoimmune group than in a control group. Um, and concluded that food intolerance testing, food sensitivity, IgG testing is a very important tool in patients with autoimmune diseases and should be performed in each patient. And I think this is when we talk about immune load, we want to be reducing that immune load. If you've got the immune load of an autoimmune disease and you're adding in that IgG reactions to food, it's exacerbating everything. And that's why we see great results with people with, uh, with inflammatory bowel disease, people with things like Sjogren's, um, MS, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, etc. So why measure food-specific IgG? It's an indicator the immune system has been triggered. It's one small part of a wide and complex immune picture. There's a complex interplay between antibody, T-cell responses, inflammatory kinases, and it's not just about the immune tolerance. Irrespective of the wider immune picture, IgG 1 and 3 in particular have strong pro-inflammatory properties. Common symptoms are wide and varied, as you'll probably all be aware. Everything from migraines and headaches, gastrointestinal problems, IBS, IBD, bloating and cramps, things like joint pains, skin problems, respiratory, psychological, low mood, uh, weight loss, weight gain and low energy are all common symptoms of food sensitivities. Quite a few more actually. We have people with, say, glue ear, mouth ulcers, um, and, and other, other factors as well where, where people have been helped by changing the diet according to IgG testing. So how do we measure food specific IgG in our laboratory? Here's some photos of our laboratory uh, and our great team that we have of uh, experienced scientists here. We actually developed the, probably the first, uh, we're certainly pioneers of food specific IgG testing in 1998 with scientists from York University under Professor Tony Robards, who was Professor of Innovation at the time. Were our laboratory is headed up by lab director Rob Wilson, who has 25 experience, years of experience in the UK's National Health Service as a healthcare professional uh, registered biomedical scientist uh, and a team of experienced scientists. We have an established food specific IgG test manufacturing facility and testing laboratory with state of the art equipment. And we developed a unique absorbent wand collection method for food specific IgG testing. We are accredited to ISO 13485, which is a medical device accreditation. It's a global accreditation and we're inspected annually by the UK Health Authority. We use established enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay ELISA technology, which I'm going to talk through a bit later on in a moment. We have 24 years experience, now 25 years actually now, of consistent high quality controlled manufacturing and testing processes. We show greater than 98% reproducibility uh, on split samples, which we run through our laboratory every week. And we run two sets of four quality controls with every single sample, not just to run every sample. And these have to pass rigorous specifications, otherwise our results are not issued and we measure all four subtypes of IgG. We offer a premium food sensitivity test for those aged 18 and above, and this analyzes IgG reactions to over 200 food and drink ingredients, providing color-coded results, which I'll show you in a moment. And uh, for children aged 2 to 17, uh, for over 100 food and drink ingredients. That's our junior food sensitivity test. In order to take the test with clean hands and a wipe, all provided in the blood collection kit, we use a lancet to prick a finger and we collect the blood sample onto a tiny little wand like this, just a few drops, which we pop back into a container, which is shipped back to our laboratory for testing. 
the actual literal one defines the volume of the sample. It's really, really clever. So we know if that's full of uh, blood, then that's, uh, that's the correct volume for us in our laboratory. We use a traditional ELISA test. So this is an ELISA plate. This is actually like 96 little dishes. Um, we use two of these for the premium and one for the junior test. You can see in A, B, C, D, you can see these are the four controls um, uh, which we run for, for, for each sample, for each plate. And I can tell you now what we do, what's happening in each of these different dishes. The actual preparation of these little dishes with the coating of the foods, uh, high quality medical grade food allergens takes two days. Um, it involves a, a high degree of skill. And once the, um, once the uh, plates are prepared and blocked to stop non-specific binding, they are dried and are desiccated and can be stored in the refrigerated. When we come to do the test, we actually um, add in your blood sample, which is diluted um, here. If it contains antibodies, so for example, if this is a cow's milk antibody um, and this is a cow's milk, the, the blue circles are cow's milk, that binds on, we give it a wash. We come in with a secondary antibody, which has got a pink square, which is our enzyme. And we add in the substrate for that enzyme and the color changes to yellow. As you can see in this uh, ELISA plate, you can see the different degrees of yellow color. These degrees of yellow color are measured not by eye, that you can't do that with this sort of testing, but using um, a spectrophotometer. So um, a light beam that actually detects the degree of yellow color in each of the little dishes. And we calibrate results and giving them a number based on our results in A, B, C, D1. You can see that the results are presented in this way. So we have a scoring system, which makes it really easy to follow up testing. You have a scoring system of 0 to 100. Anything from 20 to 100 is high reactivity, 12 to 19 borderline, 0 to 11 normal reactivity. You can see here, somebody here, this result has got a cow's milk of 100, wheat of 26, cranberry of 24, and nutmeg and peppercorn of 21. Yeast is in borderline of 15. So we'd advise that we prioritize those high reactivity foods removing them from the diet, and if possible, borderline foods as well. So when we talk about what to do next with those results, you'll all know about the five R's, and I've heard lots of different versions of the five R's over the years, but here's one option, actually six R's. Remove reaction foods identified by the IgG blood test and give the body a rest. Replace the foods with those that are equally nutritious. Repair the gut, for example, by using L-glutamine, digestive enzymes, re-inoculate with probiotics, and reintroduce the problem foods one by one, and assess tolerance because food sensitivities are not necessarily for life. It may be that somebody can tolerate the foods again. So in summary, the ELISA test formulations and design are fundamental to its effectiveness. False positive results mean the big, remain the biggest challenge for test providers and we use a proprietary formulation during the test manufacturing process in order to block false positive results. We have the advantage that we not only test in our laboratory, but we manufacture the tests as well. So we have the ultimate control. We calibrate to milk specific IgG standards to as closely possible match the markers that are being measured. And this is really important in terms of the kinetics of the testing. And really, because there are no international standards, for food specific IgG testing. There are no external proficiency schemes. The only way to show a specific food specific IgG test is effective is with evidence. And each different food specific IgG test provider must provide their own evidence of effectiveness. I know plenty of people or companies who use York test uh, data as their own. And actually, um, we, we're really proud ourselves on publishing our data. Uh, and looking at our efficacy, um, which I'll show you right now. So um, when I joined the company in 2005, we had so much data collected over the years from um, people that had taken the test. 
and actually um, then change the diet. And this was all the data was taken up and collected and, and um, directed through um, the University of York, uh, the Centre for Health, Health Economics. And I worked with them when I joined the company to publish what is still the largest um, survey data of its time. Um, and um, we looked at 5,286 people who had eliminated their sugar foods after taking a food specific IgG diet. And the results were divided into groups and the findings summarized. Overall, out of all those uh, people that had changed the diet, 76% um, of people said they showed moderate to high benefit. If they showed no benefit, it wasn't counted, um, or if they had no benefit. And this covered a wide range of different symptoms, the sort of symptoms that we talked about earlier, um, ranging from psychological to digestive through to skin, respiratory and joint pain. We broke this down. We have actually reams of data underneath all this, which actually isn't published anywhere. But I want to use this as an, uh, as an example. We have you know, 777 people had IBS, 84% reported a benefit. There's quite a lot of information here that I will go through quite quickly because I'm mindful of time. But it's important, I think, to remember that it's not just about those overarching statistics. We've got a lot of data underneath. Similarly, with things like eczema, psoriasis, acne, migraines, fatigue, depression, anxiety, um, all of those have got evidence base underneath um, for what we, we do. Um, after people changed their diet, it took about up to three weeks, really, um, three to four weeks to feel benefit. For those who adhered to the diet, 68% reported benefit in three weeks. So this is the sort of time scale you're looking at. Um, I think if you have things like energy levels, digestive problems, they tend to resolve quicker than things like skin problems or joint pains. But that's just anecdotal from the information we've gathered over the years. And interestingly, for those who dieted rigorously and reported a high level of benefit, 92.3% uh, noticed a return of symptoms on reintroducing the offending foods within those first weeks, which goes to show that we have identified the actual culprit foods. Now, this, this study back in 2007 is the first bar on this bar chart. Um, it was really the start of it. And, you know, we've collected data over the years now uh, and we review it twice annually at our quality management review meeting. And we keep on track of this all the time. I mean, these aren't small numbers either. I think we've got over 8,000 data points now. Uh, and we're still collecting the data, reviewing our surveys. In 2021, we actually uh, asked uh, an independent organisation to conduct a study for us. Um, and they actually looked at 565 people that had taken the York test, food sensitivity test, and showed they, they showed that 82% of them had reported um, feeling better and had a positive experience by taking the test and removing the foods from the diet, which actually ties in with the data we've collected over the years. So for many, you know, for many people, uh, I've had a positive experience and uh, you can see some of the Strat7 data here in a bit more detail. I like to take this down to sort of a personal level as well. You know, this is, uh, for example, let's talk about some real people. Trudy, uh, symptoms of abdominal pains, joint pains, bloating, nausea, lack of concentration, migraines, fatigue, and mouth ulcers. You know, Trudy says these symptoms would affect her work, her social life, brought on a lot of depression, she was in a lot of pain. Um, and she took our IgG test and she had reactions to gluten, cow's milk and grapes. Um, she, um, she says that, um, you know, clearly um, she feels a lot better now. Uh, this was, this was uh, feedback she gets after eight months. Clothes fit me better. I don't have the bloating. Day-to-day -day life is much better. I've not had a migraine since I removed gluten from my diet. Joint pains are improving. Fatigue is gone. Um, and I don't get mouth ulcers anymore. But the best thing is that I'm not in pain. Um, similarly, uh, this lady called Trudy, 
uh, who had um, uh, gastrointestinal uh, problems reacting to yeast at cow's milk. Um, and within the first three to four weeks, she noticed that the bloating had gone um, and a reduction in gas and wind. But after three, six weeks, um, she also noticed a difference in her weight um, and her, her weight normalized as well, which she's really pleased about. And uh, this is Eleanor. Um, again, uh, issues with um, brain fog, stomach problems and headaches, reacting to wheat, coffee, sesame and egg white. And um, <laughs> she says the first week was so hard, um, but, you know, she managed and she learned to cook from scratch again and, uh, and has never looked back. Just a few examples. So we've got a wealth of data supporting what we do is effective. Our data is unique to us and has been collected over many, many years. Um, and I feel that, you know, from when we when I started with the company in 2005, the, the science underpinning food IgG testing and use of is catching up with our findings then that you know we published back in 2007. Uh, there weren't so many studies um, supporting IgG testing. There were a few back then, but now we, we see a lot more. And I just wanted to move forward now in this uh, webinar and talk a little bit about some of the independent food-specific IgG test studies. Um, I will go through these relatively quickly. There's quite a lot of them, but I think it's useful for you all to have the referencing there. So that you can look at these in more detail and I've tried to put in links where I can so that you can find them more easily when you're watching the webinar. So, oh yes, I mean I've, worked, I've written quite a few pieces over the years, I mean more thought pieces but also summarizing, summarizing um, you know, different aspects of food IgG testing, certainly looking at things like weight loss, role in mental health, irritable bowel, and also links with sports performance. So if you're interested in these, I've got the references there for you. Um, and as I was putting this presentation together, I was really looked back to 2010 when um, this, this article was published uh, and it looked at uh, testing for food reactions, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And uh, and at that time, you know, there was some scepticism about IgG testing. Uh, not, we don't see that now, but uh, at the time there was, and, and this study came out and, and it said, among modalities used by many conventional and alternative practitioners, IgG based testing shows promise with clinically meaningful results. And that is absolutely what we've seen at York Test and, and throughout really. Uh, including the studies that I'm going to present now. So actually, this is this is an interesting study. This actually used the York test, the York test, uh, food IgG test, and was published in the British Medical Journal GUT in 2004. And it's the first uh, randomised control trial in irritable bowel syndrome looking at IgG. And it was um, published by the University of, um, Hospital of South Manchester in the UK. And the conclusion was many people with IBS would prefer a dietary solution to their problem. I mean, this was re revolutionary at the time uh, than having to take medication. And the economic benefits of this approach are obvious. This is nearly 20 years ago. The results of this study show that IgG antibodies to food have a role in helping patients identify candidate foods for elimination. Exactly what we do now. Um, and this has been backed up then with, with other studies. Um, this one by Guo, um, looking at um, food IgG antibodies in irritable bowel syndrome with diarrhea. Again, a great study, 12 weeks specific food infusion diets resulted in significant improvements in abdominal pain, bloating level and frequency, diarrhea frequency, abdominal distension, stool shape, general feelings of distress and total symptom score compared with baseline in patients with diarrhea, dominant IBS. Followed up as well by the study that I mentioned earlier, this great study by Etrosca, um, 2021, compared IgG-guided elimination diet versus FODMAP 
versus nutrition advice. And the conclusion was that diets based on IgG show significantly better results compared to other diets. Um, you know, and it, I think this is really important um, to, to remember the, the power of this. Um, my study that I, I put together in a, a summary, a review paper that I put together in 2018, showed that an increasing number of studies are emerging that show a correlation between food IgG guided elimination diet and improvement in IBS. The po point here is that each dietary intervention on this basis is personalised dependent on specific tailored results and provides a unique targeted approach. It never amazes me more when I see customer results, which I do, you know, when individual patient results, which I do on a pretty much daily basis and see how different they are, you know, with such wide breadth of, of reactions to different foods. Moving on to our autoimmune disease, Crohn's disease. Uh, great studies here, double-blind crossover diet intervention study um, shows benefit, showing that people, as you might expect actually with a damaged gut, have a higher prevalence of food IgG uh, antibodies, um, but that the, that the dietary intervention is effective. Here we go. Um, and IgG antibodies may potentially ameliorate symptoms by guiding diets for patients. Similarly, with ulcerative colitis here, a uh, lovely study by Jean et al. Uh, again, um, really helping people with the ulcerative colitis and improve quality of life. Similarly, with migraine, um, food elimination diet based on IgG antibodies in migraine. Um, this is with IBS as well, actually. Often they come together, migraine and IBS, um, showed a positive impact. And similarly here, another one with IBS and migraine together. Um, an increased serum serotonin level was seen in subjects, subjects treated with elimination diet and elimination diet combined with probiotics this time. Um, and saying that this is you know, beneficial to those with migraine plus IBS and provides new insight. Um, more studies on migraine um, showing uh, Migraine attacks are linked to food intolerance and food specific IgG is a good strategy for an elimination diet. Another one as well. And another one as well. Uh, this one was a recent study, 2021. Migraine patients with positive food specific IgG antibodies had worse migraine anxiety and gastrointestinal symptoms. Inflammatory cytokine kinds partially mediate causal pathway between food, IgG, antibodies, migraine, and migraine comorbidities. And a nice reference here in rheumatoid arthritis. It's a really old reference now, 2006, but uh, just so relevant still today. Um, really interesting group in Poland doing a lot of work on uh, the link between IgG, um, hypersensitivity, and depressive disorders. Um, and it's postulated that food-specific IgG antibodies pass through a permeable blood-brain barrier and are directly pathological to the brain, perhaps binding to important brain proteins, consistent with other findings of immune sensitivities to foods in a variety of other brain diseases and conditions, including bipolar, ataxia, epilepsy, and autism. Um, and so, um, you know, this is these are re some really, really interesting studies, um, followed up more recently by um, Teo et al, um, who looked at IgG-mediated hypersensitivity as a risk factor for adolescent depressive disorder. And in addition to um, um, major depressive disorder, other CNS diseases such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's and epilepsy are also associated with increased blood-brain barrier permeability. And long-term food antigen-specific IgG-mediated hypersensitivity may be associated with the pathogenesis of these CNS diseases. Really interesting um, study there, which I've also touched on in my review um, of paper and of mental health. When I uh, when I joined your test, we had a lot of people, and we still do have a lot of people feeding that that their weight normalises when they change the diet. You might expect that if they're changing the diet, but it's not always 
the weight loss it's sometimes weight gain in those that struggle to thrive um, and this was backed up by um, some study that came out in 2008 I was delighted to see this actually linking IgG uh, reactions to intestinal permeability and also to uh, C-reactive protein levels of inflammation um, and uh, a study that came out in 2012 then from Louis et al showed um, eliminating IgG foods from the diet and um, improves body composition quality of life in overweight persons um, and was bold enough to say the test may represent a strategy to counteract the severe US obesity epidemic. Now, so I mean, there's a lot of good evidence there, and I've just touched on some of the the actual, um, you know, the really good studies on IgG and, and following them through the years. I'd like to. Uh, I, I was re when I was researching to do this talk, actually, I was this, and this is just an aside, really, but very interesting uh, to me. Uh, I've, I found out a bit about, about um, autoimmunity. Uh, reaction, autoimmune IgG reactions. This is an IgG reaction to food, but it just fascinated me that you can have an IgG reaction to ghrelin and leptin. And ghrelin and leptin are two key hormones regulating appetite and metabolism. And studies have reported the presence of IgG autoantibodies directed to ghrelin and leptin, actually in eating disorders. Um, so this, this is a, just a recent study in, published in Appetite last year. Uh, which showed ghrelin reactive IgG showed a relationship with enjoyment of food and food fussiness in women, whereas leptin reactive IgG appeared to be related to emotional under eating in men. You know, in order to find out about more about eating disorders and the way that our appetite satiety is, is working, you know, maybe we should be measuring these autoantibodies in future. Uh, and again, it highlights the fact that autoimmunity linked to appetite. Um, you know, it highlights how important reducing the immune load on the body by removing food IgG triggers is. Once you've got one layer of autoimmunity going on, to add layers and layers more of immune load really isn't helpful. It's a reminder of the complexity of the immune system. Uh, and with gut microbiology status involved as well, we continue to unravel what's going on. Uh, watch this space. So conclusions, um, IgG mediated immunological responses play an important role in the pathogenesis of adverse food reactions. Many studies have shown levels of high IgG in serum are significantly higher in food, people with food hypersensitivity. And it's important to reduce the immune load in general on the body by removing trigger foods that are specific to you know, those particular, particular pro-inflammatory triggers. And many studies have found IgG guided elimination diet to be effective. We measure IgG because it's a robust indicator that the immune system has been triggered by a specific food. It's used as an aid to mandatory management of dietary intake. It's not a health assessment. It is not diagnostic. It cannot treat or cure. It's used as a guide by nutritional therapists and practitioners provides an effective fast track to help define an elimination diet protocol, gives the time, gut time to heal, removal of the foods identified by the test as part of the healing process. Foods can be reintroduced, elimination is not necessarily for life. That, uh, you know, once you've had that break of about three months, you can reintroduce foods back into your diet and you may be able to tolerate small amounts again. And there's a substantial amount of evidence that diet adjusted to food IgG can lead to symptom improvement. York test, um, a trusted partner indeed, heritage, expertise and evidence-based. We have our own laboratory, quality control measures, accuracy and reproducibility. We use milk specific IgG calibration, reference method to measure all four subtypes of IgG. We have really ease of use, unique fingerprint blood wand, 0 to 100 scaled results for ease of tracking. And we've optimized signal to noise ratios and minimized over recording with effective blocking ELISA test design. Main take home, if efficacy data is vital, not just a few subjects, 
thousands of subjects and we have thousands of data points to show that the test we've developed is effective. Thank you. Uh, wonderful. Um, thank you uh, so much, Dr. Hart, uh, for this uh, great presentation. I'm sure you just want to take a little break here. Um, you also, it was great, you outlined several notable case studies, very, very helpful information, and your test has been a trusted partner to Avexia. Uh, we really appreci appreciate being able to uh, uh, work with you. Um, uh, I think at this time, I'm just going to highlight a couple of these things uh, with Ask the Doctor, and then we're going to go through after we've learned about the food sensitivity, IgG, and the York test. I'd like to review how to order the test before concluding the webinar. I do want to mention Ask the Doctor, which we have here. Uh, Dr. Wayne Sedano, our Director of Clinical Support and Education. Um, our practitioners do have access for any lab interpretation, questions on clinical conditions, any results that they want reviewed that is found on the left-hand side of the Avexia portal. Uh, email consultation is absolutely free or practitioners can sign up for a live consultation and get right to his Zoom meeting. Hey, Joanne, uh, Dr. Sedano here. I just want to jump in just with a, just a few notes and, and uh, thank you. And, and just personally thank Dr. Hart for just an absolutely wonderful, wonderful presentation. Uh, the you. ease of, do, of doing this test, uh, very well explained the calibration, which I love. I get a lot of questions on, well, how are these things calibrated? Well, you, you laid it out great. And, you know, one of the top things that I take away here was reducing that inflammatory load. That it can happen as quick as getting the test back and start the patient, like, right away on removing those foods. And I remember years ago, it was like 20 years ago, you know, I asked myself, I asked myself very simple questions. Why well, in the world would the immune system mistake a food for an allergy? And, and, and it's quite simple. You know, when you're thinking about this, first of all, cooking is going to denature proteins for, for one thing. When you think about that, and, and the body does not want to see, or at least the intestine does not want to see anything larger than an amino acid, a dipeptide, or a tripeptide. So if digestion is, is poor, uh, if there is a, a downgrade of the intestinal mucosal lining, which also helps with, with the digestive process, as you know, all of those things are going to be large proteins hitting the, the area causing an immune system reaction. So, uh, you know, I really think it's important to take a look at that and take a look off, what, like you said, by looking at this IgE sensitive food. Um, and by the way, we, we gut, as we know, and you mentioned that so eloquently, can activate those T cells, they can trigger uh, degranulation of, of histamine containing mast cells, which can create a whole bunch of symptoms, as you know. So you know, the, the takeaway is here, if you have this particular type of test, you immediately take the pressure, take the load off the immune system, give the gut time enough to heal, your proper digestion, and potentially reintroduce those foods. And you know, I can't thank you enough for the way you laid this out. Um, uh, and again, th th thank you so much. Always, always a pleasure. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Dr. Hart, do you want to move to the next slide? There we go. All right, so um, we're just going to walk through how to quickly order a York test. So from your Avexia uh, dashboard on the left-hand side, you are going to click on lab orders. Then you're going to either register your patient or create uh, uh, the new patient, and you're going to go to add new lab order. Then you're going to select specialty testing, and then the next step, you're going to find the York test product to the order. Use the search box to locate the desired test and add it to the cart by clicking the blue plus uh, symbol on the left-hand side. Then preview your order, review the details, and make any edits that are needed. Then I just agree to the terms and the conditions and, and click the button that says place order. It's just that simple. And the next slide, please. And then for any questions or issues you may have, please contact Avexia Diagnostics by email at info at avexiadiagnostics.com or by phone five days a week at our extended hours, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 888-852-2723. A recording of this webinar will be available by email in the next few days.
Thank you, Dr. Hart and Dr. Sedano for this informative presentation. Thank you again for joining us for this webinar event. Until next time, from everyone at Avexia Diagnostics and York Test, stay healthy, stay safe, and we wish you all the best on your pathway to wellness. Good night, everyone. Hey, good night, Joanne. Dr. Hart, thanks again. Bye-bye now. That's great. Thank you very much. All righty. Bye-bye. Looks good.